50 and 51 is the beginning of your review for the first test. This, there's a study guide which gives you, so if you turn to page 51, you'll, you'll know what I'm referring to. It's, it's a list of the topics and the ideas that you should be familiar with and hopefully fairly comfortable with. And then it says sample test problems. They're sample test problems, they're not a sample test. So in other words, just because you work through those problems doesn't mean on Wednesday you're going to get a test and it's going to look like that. They're, they're problems taken from other tests over the years and, you know, I've been teaching this course for longer than almost some of you are old. Um, so they're just kind of random um, examples. They don't cover everything. They're not meant to be inclusive. They're just some practice. Okay, so the quiz, how I would use the quiz if I were you, is I'd look at the quiz and I'd look for what does it look like I've kind of got down pat, I feel pretty comfortable with. What does it look like I still need some work on? And then I would focus on those sections either in your book or in your homework, look at some sample test questions that might be similar to that. So when you think you've you know studied it and you're feeling okay, then you try the sample test. The other thing I just want to mention is that these sample test questions do not give you any true-false questions, but every single section in your textbook at the end, when you look at the homework, there's always a true-false section, and it's the same directions that I gave you on the quiz. So if you feel like you want some more help with that type of question, then do some of those true-false questions, okay? It will also tell you to change the sentence so it's true and you can get used to that. Um, the other thing, and I'll talk more about this on Monday, but one of the other things I do on a test is I'll say, give an example of. And I might say a second degree trinomial. Okay, so you have to know what second degree means and you have to know what a trinomial means. So you also have to review the language that we've been working on in the class. So, um, there's lots to do. I wouldn't suggest waiting until Tuesday night at midnight to start studying for the test on Wednesday. I would just, you know, chunk it out a little bit, just do a little bit at a time, and the main thing on Tuesday is getting a good night's sleep. All right. Any questions about next week, the review or the test? Anything? All right. Um, so the page before that, page 48 and 49, if you look at page 48 and 49, notice page 48, this is also found on, is called the equation summary aid. And you see in the left-hand column a lot of equations. Um, we've done linear and quadratic and everything else we're going to be, and we've done rational equation, equations. So we've done three out of the first four. Those other equations we're, we're covering today. So what this is, is you can fill this out with an example like in the right-hand column and do it all out, and then in the middle write, like in your own language, how you solved it. And then for your test, since you're allowed to bring in one page, you could bring in just the front, because the back side of this is just directions, so there's nothing on that. You could bring in this page and then one side of another page, or sometimes students will like tape the other their page on the back. So that way, when you come to the equation solving part of the test on Wednesday, you have a handy dandy reference sheet to look at. Okay? So that can also be found on our Moodle site. And I don't think you'll lose your packet. I hope not. And then the other thing I just want to point out is that our Moodle site also has sample videos, sample test one videos. These are videos that go over each one of the sample test problems. So if you're looking at those problems and you're home alone and you don't, you know, it's too late and you're stuck and you can't call anybody or text someone or whatever from class or friend, you can just go out to your Moodle site and look at this. Okie doke. All right, so today we're going to start doing the uh, preview exercises. Um, I'm not going to worry about the challenge one, but I would like you to take, say, 10 minutes to work on this if you haven't already done so and I'll be asking people to come up and fill this in so I'll be writing some names up here um, so take 10 minutes and then we'll start the
class demo. All right, so the first expression, what did you have to remember to start factoring number one? What was the thing you had to remember? Greatest common factor, right. So the GCF here was X, and that was the first step in your factoring, and then the second step was taking this second degree degree trinomial and factoring it into what a lot of you are used to seeing, two baby binomials. Okay. So if you multiplied this out, you'd get right back to where you started. Okay, this second one is a pattern that I was hoping you just to keep working on it from your previous class. And if you look at your previous class, they introduced the idea of conjugates. And they define conjugates to look like this. So these two factors right here, x plus 2i and x take away 2i are conjugates of each other. And anytime you see a factorization like that, you square the x, you square the 2, and you put a plus there. Because what you end up getting is x squared minus 4i squared. But remember, i squared is negative 1, so that changes subtraction to addition. So we now have a way to factor sums of perfect squares, which we didn't get before. We weren't able to with only real numbers. But now that we have imaginary numbers and complex numbers, we can factor that. So when you see the sum of perfect squares, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you see x squared plus anything squared, whatever that anything is, whatever the number is, then it's x it's the square root of x squared, right, plus the square root. Oh, it's going to get too fancy to say square root of anything, so let's just stick with what we have. So if we had, for example, x squared plus 1 and we wanted to factor that, can anybody do that for me really quick, really quick? Nope, because x plus 1 times x minus 1 is x squared mi minus 1. Right? These are real numbers, so I get difference of perfect squares. So let's try it again. You want to try it again, Paul? Ben, sorry. X plus I times, yeah, X minus I. All right. Because so that will give you X squared minus I squared. I squared is minus 1. X, t X squared take away negative 1 is 1. Okay. The mistake I saw people in my first class make on this, and it also happened in this class, this does not say one-third times negative eight. It's an exponent. And this is class number one. So this says the cube root of negative eight, and you have to remember your order of operations. You do anything that has an exponent prior to multiplying. So this is 11 times negative 2 because that's the cubed root of negative 8. This one asks you to find the cubed root of negative 8 and then square it. So that's a 4. So 5 times 4 plus 11 times negative 2 plus 2. The question is, does that equal 0? And you just keep working on the left side until you get that it's 22 take away negative 22 and that equals zero and everything's kosher. So that's a true statement. So when you're asked if something is a true statement like on your quiz and you had something like, um, I'm trying to think of the one that, let me see. Um, oh, five plus one over Z equals six over Z. I didn't ask you to solve that equation which is what some of you did, I asked you if this is true. And it's not true because 5 is, in order to make, in order to add these, you have to have common denominators. So you have to multiply top and bottom of 5 by z in order to get a denominator with z. So this becomes 5z plus 1 over z. So this is not a true statement. You just don't add the numerators and put it over z because 5 is not over z. Same thing with this, x plus whatever it was squared, and I had x squared plus 64. Some of you tried to solve that. can't solve that. But number one, it's not true. All I'm saying, does this left side equal the right side? True or false? The direction said 
determine whether each statement is true or false. This is x squared plus 16x plus 64. That does not equal x squared plus 64. Okay, so you have to be, read your, that's why doing a few of those um, true false questions at the end of each section might help you out with that. All right, and then this last one we're going to use today when we come to equations with rational exponents because that's what we call these exponents right here, rational exponents. All of the exponents we look at, even when it's x squared, is a rational number, but it just kind of helps you to remember that it's a fraction and we don't like fractions, right? So one of the things we always want to do when we solve an equation is say x equals, right, x. And that usually has, well, x has an exponent of 1. So if we start out with x to the 3 quarters and we want to do something to that so we get x, then we could raise that to a power. And so all this is having you practice doing is saying that number that you raise x to the 3 quarters to to get x has to be the reciprocal because when we multiply reciprocals, we always get 1. That's a property of reciprocals. All right, so today we're going to look at a few different types of equations, and we're going to quickly review what we do when we have an inequality and we solve an inequality. Polynomial equations, um, number one, you look at that and you look at your sheet and you think about what we've done so far. We've done linear equations and quadratic, right? You look at that and you say it's not linear and it's not quadratic. So there's something else going on. It's a higher degree. In fact, we would call this uh, an equation of de uh, a fourth degree equation. This is a fourth degree equation. So it doesn't fall under, if you look at your summary sheet, your equation summary sheet, it doesn't, it, it doesn't fall under linear or quadratic. This is what we call a polynomial equation. So if you think about how to solve it, you say, well, maybe the way I solved a quadratic equation will help me if I can get everything on one side and zero on the other. So let's get this 6x squared over to the left side and then take a look at it. x to the fourth plus x to the third minus 6x squared equals zero. And now you say to yourself, if I can somehow get the left side so it's a big multiplication problem. So if I can get a multiplication problem on this side, multiplication equal to zero, then I can use that idea about each factor having to equal zero, right? That's called the zero product. We want to use this idea of zero, product that equals zero. So if I want to turn this into a multiplication problem, then that means I have to factor, 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 right? You can't get away from it. And the best thing that's going to help you with factor, 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 when you see all terms having your variable to some power in it, there's no, con there's no constant term here, you know you have to have a greatest common factor. So your greatest common factor here on the left side is x to the second power. They all have at least two factors of x in them. So your first form of factoring is the GCF. You pull the GCF out, and since you have one, two, three terms in there, you must have three terms in the parentheses. And let me just like warn you about a little mistake that students make. If this last term here was just x squared instead of negative 6x squared, if it was just x squared, sometimes students just put two things in here. What you're really doing is you're saying, if I divide this by x squared, what do I have left? I have an x squared left. If I divide this by x squared, I have 1x left. And if this was minus x squared, if you divide that by x squared, you have 1 left. You don't have negative 1. You don't have 0. So you just always got to check that. If you have three terms here and you pull out a greatest common factor, you should have three terms in here just like that. Okay. You'll see this later in your class activity. It's a mistake students make sometimes and they go, oh no, where am I going? All right, now I can't factor x squared anymore. I could call it x times x if I want. The other thing is be on the lookout, right? What are we looking out for? See our highest degree here is four, so we can expect up to four answers. And it, we might have some identical twins and 
if you have identical twins, you still have two kids, right? Even if they look the same. So that's the same with solutions. We count them. If you have two the same, we count them twice. Okay, so we get x squared. Now we factor this. Factors of 6 that differ by, what's that number in there? 1. So what factors of 6 differ by 1? 2 and 3, or 3 and 2. Right, see how quickly you can do it? x and x, 3 and 2. Now you pay attention to which one's addition and which one's subtraction. Yeah, the 3 has to carry all the weight here because it ended up being positive. Now you have three factors. You could say you had four if you want to write this as x times x. So you take each individual factor and you set it equal to zero and you solve. So these, these two right here are baby linear equations. They only take one step to solve. And the square root uh, x squared equals zero has two solutions, but given that it's zero, they're identical, so x equals zero. So you really have four answers here, zero, zero, two, and negative three, but we have identical twins. So it looks like three different um, zeros. Now the reason I'm sort of, I, I spent a little more time than I should have in the first class talking about this idea about four zeros is because pretty soon we're going to be replacing this zero with a y. Not pretty soon, probably like six weeks. And we're going to be asked to graph it. Knowing this is where it crosses your x-axis. It's going to cross the x-axis at negative 3, because when it's negative 3, y would be 0. Like if I replace that with a y, just imagine that being a y when y is 0. 2 and at 0. Okay. And the fact that this has identical twins at 0 tells me that when I'm graphing this, it's either going to look like that or like this, depending on I have to know a little bit more. So this thing might come down like this, come up, come down, and then come back up like this. It might be like a W. See how it goes straight through the axis there and there, but here it turns around? That's because of this thing right here. It looks like a little baby parabola right there. All right, so that's where we're going in a few weeks. You can totally ignore everything I just said. Let's take that out of there. We don't need to worry about that. All right, so beyond the outlook for polynomial equations, they'll have more than one or two solutions generally, not always, but depending on what it looks like. x to the fourth minus 1 equals 0 only has one solution. That's quadruplets, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Right? To solve a radical equation, what do we do? Well, you want to isolate the radical, get it all by itself, and then undo the radical. So to do that, to undo the square root, you would raise both sides to the second power. So it's really just two steps. Again, radical equations aren't too hard to recognize. You see that big radical sign there. So you want to isolate it all by itself. So you subtract x from both sides. And you get the square root of x equals 12 minus x. Now right now, to avoid any errors, as always, whether it's a numerator or a denominator or something like this, whenever you have more than one term, put it in parentheses. So whatever you do to both sides, you do it to the entire side. All right, we want to undo the square root. I can undo that. Well, again, this really comes back to the preview x activity because the square root of x can be written that way. And what do we want to do? We want to turn the square root of x into x to the first power. So one way to do that is to raise it to the second power or square both sides. So we're going to square this side. We're going to square that side. And when we do that, we get x to the first because squaring and square rooting are inverse operations of each other. They undo each other, and you're right back to x. And here's where you got to be. you got to say, whoa, oh, watch out. It's either going to be like that or it's going to be like this. This caught some of you the true-false question. When you square and you have subtraction and addition inside, you can't use your exponent properties because your exponent properties only apply to multiplication and division. So the only thing you're going to use here is the definition of an exponent, which says 
multiply that by itself. So we get one, if you do it all out, this is what you'll end up getting. If you need me to do that, I will. I'm going to skip some steps here. I make assumptions, but please stop me if you say, I, I can't get from that to that. If you can't get there, I'll be happy to do all the steps. It's never a problem. Ask any time. Now what kind of equation do I have? Quadratic, right? Because it's second degree. Did I start off with a quadratic equation? No, I didn't. So, you know, something funky is going to happen here. I didn't start off with a quadratic, and suddenly I went from an equation that the highest power I saw on it was a 1 to a square. So before you even start radical equations in big, bold letters, right under here, always, always, always check your answers. That's what you got to make sure you have on your cheat sheet and beside you when you're doing radical equations or equations with fractional exponents. Always check because we know with quadratics we get two answers. Probably both of them are not going to work in my original equation where I only had a highest degree of 1. Okay, how do I solve this? What are you going to do? What do you do with every quadratic equation pretty much? Well, something before you factor. Set it equal to 0. I like how you said factor. Yeah, you got to set it equal to zero. So, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? Put all the right side on the left side because you think everything's supposed to be on the left side, or what? What are you gonna do? Subtract x. The other thing I would do personally is I would first write this in what we call descending order, where we have our highest degree first and our second degree second. I mean, our highest degree first, and then our next lowest degree, and then our constant if we have one. So we're going to factor. That will help me not say it like I'm from Boston if I do it like Ian says. Okay, so x take away x is a 0. x squared, and don't mess up here with your adding negative numbers, minus 25x plus 144. Okay, now some of you, because you're a little still a little bit phobic about factoring, you may just throw that into the quadratic formula, but all oh, the numbers are big and huge and yucky yuck. You know how easy this is to do? Factors of 144. It takes a little bit of time, but not too much. That add up to 25. I'm not going to start with the, like, the factors that are really far apart, like 1 and 144 and 2 and 72. Those will never add up to 25. I'm going to sort of look middle of the road. So I'm going to start with 6. Oh, no, I better not start with 6. I'm going to start with 4. Because 2 goes into it, 3 goes into it, so let's start with 4. 4 goes into it what? How many times? 36, okay? And 36 and 4 adds up to 40. So I'm in the ballpark. I'm getting close to 25. Um, I know 5 doesn't divide 144 because it doesn't end in 0 or 5. So now I'm going to tr try my next number, 6. 6 goes into 144 once. 19 times, what's that add up to? 19 plus 6 adds up to what? 25, which is what I'm looking for. So it's just x take away 16 and x take away 9, and look how easy that is when you set each factor equal to 0. It doesn't take forever, and you're not dealing with that quadratic, yucky quadratic formula that's going to give you all these big, huge numbers, and you've got to pull out your calculator. It's not right. What did I do wrong? Oh, oh, so I made a mistake, huh? All right, all right. So, well, see, better use a quadratic formula, right? Uh, even the teacher can't factor that. All right, so six times, what is it, 24? All right, what's next? Seven, does seven go into 144? Nah, you'd think it would because it started with 14, but that doesn't work. How about 8? Does 8 go into 124? 18. Ooh, look at how close we're getting. So what's the magic answer going to be? 16 and 9, right? Huh? 
So I, I had the right answer. I just wasn't patient with myself when I, I put the wrong thing in there. Okay. So now this is, remember, you have two possible answers here that's going to make that equation zero. But this is where you got to go back to your original equation, which looked like this. Um, this is always go back to the original and check each answer. If I put nine in there, I'm checking each answer here. You're happy with nine, so you can circle it, or you can put it in your solution set. And now we have to determine if 16 will work. 16 plus the square root of 16, does that equal 12? 16 plus 4 does not equal 12. That's what we call extraneous. We introduced the possibility of a new, another solution that doesn't work in the past. So this is called extraneous. You can just cross it off. Okay. That's why it's so critical with radical equations and your equations with rational exponents to always check it with the original. You should always check anyway, but you know it's one of those things that we just don't bother doing, right? Because we have the answer key. Uh, we have calculators sometimes. Even you, this is a great time to use your calculator to check. Yeah. Where about this would this happen? Like that? I, I see how it's how it happens. But that's awesome. You know what? I asked that question once, and I got the greatest explanation by looking at graphs. So I would be happy to show you sometime, and it really helped you to see what happens. Why this? And it was one of my colleagues that showed me, why does this happen? And they showed me how to do it. I'd have to like think about it because it's been probably like six years since I asked that question. But it's really an interesting um, thing to actually see it visually why that happens. Other questions? So I'll, I'll ask for a, a tutorial and then I'll get back to you, Victor, or anybody else that wants to know. All right, so of course we naturally progress from radicals to equations with these fractional exponents. Because they, you could really do them the same way. You could change this into the fourth root of x cubed with a radical symbol if you wanted. But that little preview exercise, remember that preview exercise where we had x to the 3 fourths and we were trying to figure out how to make it x to the first? That's the strategy you use here. Yep, the key to equations with rational exponents is to isolate the term with the rational exponent, just like we isolated the radical. You have two methods to choose from. You can either convert it to a radical equation like we just did and solve it, or you can raise both sides to an appropriate power. What power is appropriate? Well, the one that gives us x to the first power, because we're trying to solve for x. So let's we're not going to convert it to radical because we just did a radical equation so let's see what this would look like so we want to isolate this what does isolate mean it means we want it on one side of the equation only one side with one for the coefficient so it's the only term only term on one side only term on one side of the equation. I'm doing a little editing here. With one for the coefficient. That's what it means to isolate. So we want it to be x to the 3 quarters. That's our goal. Equals some number over here. That's our first goal. That's what it means to isolate. So to do that, we have to first get rid of the term negative 6 by adding 6, or the subtraction of 6 by adding 6 to both sides. So we get 3 times x to the 3 quarters equals 6. So we're halfway home. We've got the term on one side, but it's not isolated in the sense that it still has a coefficient different than 3. So now I divide both sides by 3. And I get x to the 3 quarters equals 2. Okay. So now you raise both. You want x to the first power. So you say to yourself, x to the 3 quarters raised to what power will give me x to the first power? And that's exactly what we just did in our preview activities. 
We know that when we have a power raised to a power, we multiply those two numbers. So the only number that I can multiply three quarters by to get one is its reciprocal. So that means I raise both sides to the four thirds powers. So now I take this and I raise this side to the four third power and this side to the four thirds power. So I get X equals two to the fourth, 16 to the one third power, or I could just say two to the four thirds. However you want to write it, you can't simplify it any further, or if you want, you could say the cubed root of 16. I don't really care, okay? 16 to the four-thirds power. Oh, excuse me, two to the four-thirds or 16 to the one-third. So all I did here to get 16 to the one-third is I said two to the fourth is 16th, and then I've got to take the cubed root, and I just left it like that. But 16 is not a perfect cube, so I can't simplify it. And this came up on the quiz too. Some, whenever I ask you for an answer, I'm always asking for the exact answer. If I want an estimate, like I want you to throw this in your calculator and estimate it to say two decimal places, I'll let you know. But you don't have to put this in and tell me that it's, you know, two point something something, right? So unless I ask you for an estimate, always leave the exact answer. See, they don't always come out perfectly nice and sometimes they, they're just irrational numbers and that's okay. Any questions on this? This technique is a little different. Some of you might like it and feel okay with you, and others will end up making it a radical equation and just doing the, what we did a minute ago. All right, the final uh, type of equation is on the bottom of the page, and students have so much difficulty with absolute value equations, and, and you make them somehow in your mind a lot more difficult than they need to be. So here's a little explanation. The stuff that's inside the absolute value can either be 11, because the absolute value of 11 is 11, or that stuff inside could be negative 11. Right? So those are your two equations to solve. When is the stuff inside 2x plus 1 11? And when is the stuff 2x plus 1 equal to a negative 11? Those are two baby linear equations to solve. And I've done everything I could think of. I used to talk about just starting off with something like this. And I used to say x is a goat. And I used to try to draw this little goat, which I'm not very good at. And I say, you know, the goat is tied up. It's tied up to the origin, the zero point. And how far can the goat roam? The goat can only roam to 11, and the goat can only roam to negative 11, because that is the distance from zero. That's the absolute value. That's 11. So this goat, I could do a little more. I, instead of starting from the origin, I could tell you where the, you know, where the goat could roam, right? But I don't want to get into all that. But think of that as just this, this thing is tied up, and it only has so much freedom. It can go to 11 or it can go to negative 11, and that's as far as it can go. So 2x plus 1 is 11, or 2x minus 1, oops, plus 1 is negative 11. So what you don't want to do is what I just did. You don't want to change the stuff. The stuff is the stuff. It's the stuffing in your pillow. You can't change it. It might get flatter. It might get, you know, you can move it around depending, but it's 2x plus 1. What do I see people doing? People, and notice, do either of these two equations have any absolute values in them? No. You, you drop the absolute value sign. You drop it. And you say it's either the positive 11 or the negative. I see students doing this, which I want to know, you know how they know they can do this kind of thing. They'll do this, and they'll get one of the answers right. Yeah, they won't do the plus or minus, and they'll get, they'll just do this. They, they keep this absolute value sign. Um, oops, five, yeah, five. You know, and that's one of your answers, but you'll never get the other answer that way. Uh, I see students, did they decide, oh, yeah, since absolute value involves a positive and a negative number, sometimes they just think that they'll take 2x plus 1, and they change it to 2x minus 1 and set it equal to 11. I mean, Make up some really inventive and creative ways to solve it, 
But all you really have to remember is that there's two possibilities inside this absolute value, the number 11 and the number negative 11. And whatever expression is inside there, the goatee, just set it equal to 11 and negative 11. Yeah, I heard students in my last class talking about the goat. All right, yeah, Victor? Outside of the 2x plus 1? Yes. Yeah, that's the other way to do it. So let me finish this way, and then I'll talk about the other way. So minus 1, minus 1, this is the one that 99% of the students will get that answer. And someone, they're so happy they, they're done, right? No, because it's also equal to negative 11, and you get 2x equals negative 12, x equals negative 6. And check. Go back and check. If you put a 5 in here, you get 2 times 5 plus 1 equals 10 plus 1, which is 11. That equals 11. You're happy. And if you put in a negative 6, you get 2 times negative 6 plus 1, which is negative 12 plus 1, which is negative 11. And the square root of negative 11 is 11. Absolute value. Absolute value, right. Because um, I'm already thinking ahead of what Victor wants to see. So that's one way to think about it. Victor wants you to look at these two things right here. The absolute value of 11 is 11. The absolute value of the opposite of what's in here is 11. See how both of those equations have 11 on the right side? So what Victor's saying is the other approach is to say, okay, the absolute value is equal to 11. So I can either take the expression that's in there, 2x plus 1, and set it equal to 11, or the opposite of that expression that's in there. The problem is you've got to remember to put it in parentheses. This will give you the same exact answer as up here. This is exactly the same equation, x is 5. This is minus 2x minus 1 equals 11. This is... Oh, yeah, add 1, minus 2x equals 12, x equals negative 6. Oops, negative 6. I'm rushing because I want you to get to your class activities. Both of them work. The only thing is I've seen a lot of errors here. People will write 2x minus 1. They'll only take change the sign of part of the expression. But they both work. Whatever works for you, first... The first thing that you should see every time you, you write an abs, uh, solve an absolute value equation, you should write two baby equations. I don't care if they look like these two in green or these two in red. Okay? You don't have any equations with absolute values. They disappear because you're taking care of it. You're solving for the absolute value. Okay. Rick, do you, Rick, do you still have a question? Uh, not a question. It's just uh, I would move the negative one first. Okay. Yes, what you were. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's true. So if, in other words, to solve this, instead of distributing negative 1 through, you could divide both sides by negative 1, and then it looks exactly like it was up top. It all comes around to the same thing, but how we see it and understand it is very different sometimes. So uh, whatever works for you, uh, please feel free. Any other questions before we move along to class activities? Class activities is quite a few different things. I'm not going to cover the inequalities. Cover this on your own. Just do this first one and check it with me and then go on to, well, I should probably do this, sorry. All right, I'll try to do this in a couple minutes. This, this inequality, the solution is an entire set of numbers, number one. It's not one answer. The only thing you have to remember is that if you multiply and divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, you reverse the sign of the inequality. So in other words, if I divide this side by negative 4 and that side by negative 4, and, you're, and if you're, um, oops, that's supposed to be an 8, and if you ever wonder whether your answer should say x less than 2 or x greater than 2, it's so easy just to go like this on a number line and say, 
where's my set of, where's my set? Is it less than two or bigger than two? Plop a number out. Take, oops, negative two. Sorry, folks. See, when I rush, I make mistakes. So <laughs> take a number from the set to the left of negative two, like negative five. Go back. Negative four times negative five, that's 20. That's not less than eight. It's got to be numbers to the right of negative two. That's greater than. So you have to reverse that symbol to the opposite direction. This is just two of these. You can either separate it out, say negative six is less than x minus four, and x minus four is less than or equal to one, and just solve that. There's no, there's no multiplying or dividing by a negative here. So here you get x is greater than negative two, and here you get x is less than five. Smush them together, put x back in the middle, and there you go. Or you can say, I want to be really cool here. You don't have to be really cool in my class. You can do things out the long way. I don't want to separate them out. I just know that if I add 4 to my middle, I add 4 to both of my ends. I get negative 2, I get an x, and I get a 5. So the solution set looks like this. Negative 2 with an open circle or a parenthesis if you're thinking about my math lab and a closed circle for five, and it's every single number between that, including five, all right? Look over the class activities. Look at the ones that you think might give you the most, most 